that they're going to start to distance themselves from Putin, from his cult of personality. I think we will see the beginning of a process of de-Putinization happening quite soon after Putin has left or has been gathered by the Grim Reaper. Can you define what you mean by de-Putinization? Well, I think it will be convenient to the next leader of Russia to blame the problems on Putin and say these were Putin's personal decisions. They will try to retain the essence of the same system of control. But when you take the war in Ukraine, the next leader of Russia, who will not be a liberal Democrat, uh, I think we can totally exclude that possibility, alas, uh, will at least have the possibility of saying this war is costing us a horrific amount in casualties and in finance. Uh, and what benefits is it bringing us? We're under sanctions from the West. Uh, we are gaining very, very little. We're actually gaining nothing from this war. And so they could take a more pragmatic decision that Putin absolutely is incapable of taking, despite the fact that the regime would not suddenly become a much nicer regime than the current one. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. And this time we're talking to a former British ambassador to Russia who spent 34 years dealing with the USSR and Russia until 2004. Sir Roderick Lyne has since visited around 50 times, in fact, more than that, as a businessman, a writer and a lecturer. Sir Roderick, welcome to Frontline. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, you've written a very comprehensive Substack article called Putin and Beyond, looking back at President Putin's 24-year history in power, either directly or indirectly, and forwards as he embarks almost certainly on another six-year term. Can you just explain the election process? Who and how many people can vote and when the re result will actually be announced? Well, for the first time, Russians are voting over three days, which makes sense in such a large country. There's 112 million Russians eligible to vote over the age of 18 out of a population of 140 million. And Russians are also allowed to vote overseas. There are polling stations in, I think, over 100 countries, slightly fewer than there were in the 2018 election, when nearly half a million Russians overseas voted. Quite a lot of them then, pre-war, were voting for Putin. It will be interesting, uh, if we have a means of finding out, to know how the Russians overseas are going to vote this time, because an awful lot of them, of course, are exiles who have left as a result of the war. Will they spoil their ballots? Will they bother to vote? All of those questions. Uh, the other important factor is that this time, for the first time in a Russian presidential election, they are going to be using electronic voting procedures, and that is much easier for the Kremlin to manipulate and control. Indeed. And of course, also the Russian occupied areas of Ukraine will be voting as well. Uh, they will, and you can guess that they're not going to be voting very freely. And of course, a lot of those people will be actually Ukrainian citizens who are simply under the jackboot of the Russian military. Mm. Let's turn the clocks back when Putin first became acting, acting president in December 1999. What did he set out to do exactly? Can you describe the country and what his concept was at the time? Well, Putin, when he came in, he inherited a country that was in economic distress and he set out to integrate Russia with the West to get membership of the G7, to build a very strong partnership with NATO and with the European Union and to build up his personal contacts with Western leaders, starting with Tony Blair. And for the first term that he was president, that was the direction of Russian foreign policy. It was essentially about joining Europe, joining the West and also within Russia about modernizing the Russian economy, making it more efficient, actually making it more honest and law abiding. Uh, it was all about economic reform. It all changed in about 2004, 2005. I'll ask you a bit more about that in a moment. And as he consolidated his power, he repeatedly spoke out for democratic values, human rights, justice, ideals of freedom. Do you think he ever believed in what he was preaching? Uh, no, I don't, because Putin was brought up in the KGB. He was brought up in the most thuggish branch of the KGB. He was tramping the streets of Leningrad in 1975 with some of the people who are in the Kremlin with him now, suppressing dissidents, any human rights campaigners, and keeping an eye on foreigners. And I think, you know, by the time that Putin was 40 years old and the Soviet Union was collapsing, uh, a 
deep hatred of the West was imbued in him and a great deep suspicion in his very paranoid personality. Uh, and I don't think he believes in democratic values. But the interesting thing was that in the year 2000, he thought the Russian people wanted to hear that. There was really uh, a very strong interest in making Russia more like the rest of Europe at that time. Mm, and you were British ambassador to Moscow from the early 2000s. What was it like living there at the time? And what was it like being the British ambassador? It was marvellous. It was the highest point of Russia's relations with Britain in, in their entire history since 1553, I would say. We were able to meet Russians of every kind. We were cooperating with the Russians in every field you could think of. We were even helping to dismantle their nuclear submarines, to destroy their chemical weapons. Trade was increasing, investment was increasing. We had strong political context. We were working with them to make Russia a better place. And it was I was incredibly fortunate to be there uh, at a time like that. And the other interesting thing was, at that time, because Russia was improving, uh, a lot of Russians who had gone west in the 1990s, got educated in the west, were working in western businesses, started coming back to Russia because the opportunities for them in Russia were much better. Now those same people, the talented, educated, younger Russians, have left in, in, in large numbers, about two million of them over the, uh, uh, over the period since 20, 2005, about a million uh, since this war began, and it swung right in the opposite direction. But I was lucky to be there at such a good time. And at that time, did you get a sense of what President Putin's uh, view of Europe and the West was? And did you get a chance to meet him on, on many occasions? Uh, I saw quite a lot of him in that period because he kept receiving very senior British visitors like Tony Blair, Robin Cook, Princess Anne, uh, people like that. Uh, we did a state visit to London in 2003. So uh, I saw Putin at pretty close quarters over that period. I haven't seen him since 2008 when I sat across a lunch table with him with a group of people. And I knew the people around Putin pretty well. And the Kremlin was really open to us. You could walk in there and just meet people and talk to them in the normal way as an ambassador in any Western country could do. So what did he seem like to you at the time? Uh, cold, calculating, slightly distant, very much thinking about the sort of reaction that other people were having, quite insecure at the beginning. He was very conscious that he had no political background. He'd never made a lot of political speeches. And he was meeting big political figures like Helmut Kohl, Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, Jacques Chirac. And he was studying them and I think asking himself, how do I become a big man like them? Mm, interesting. Um, when you look back now, how do you make sense of the fact that back in 2002, when the NATO Russia Council was upgraded, President Putin publicly agreed to a second NATO enlargement to include the Baltic states? How do you view that with the benefit of hindsight now? Well, this was absolutely part of the warp and weft of Putin's policy at the time. Uh, the very first significant act that Putin made when he had become the acting president of Russia was to invite the NATO Secretary General George Wash, uh, George Robertson to mm. come to Moscow to bury the hatchet because there'd been a row with NATO over the bombing of Belgrade less than a year before. And Putin wanted Russia to get so close to NATO and the European Union and indeed to the United States that Russia would be heard, would have leverage there. Uh, and so this was a very deliberate policy on his part, initiated by him, actually against the advice of quite a lot of his officials and his defense ministry who didn't like NATO. It was a calculated decision to build up relations with NATO. And as far as he was concerned, it wasn't a big problem that NATO was admitting the Baltic states. Uh, his line on NATO obviously changed radically later on. But at that time, he was not depicting NATO as a threat. The people that Putin and the Russian leadership were worried about at that time were the Chinese. Uh, mm. They didn't say it publicly, but privately, Russian generals would say to me that the long term strategic threat to Russia is the Chinese and the short term strategic threat they saw as being uh, Islamist terrorism coming through Chechnya. It wasn't NATO. At what point did Putin turn against the West? <laughs> 
I think definitively from the time of the Orange Revolution at the end of 2004, beginning of 2005, I think that was the absolute turning point. But things had started to change over the previous year, partly because the oil price had risen so high that Russia was suddenly awash with money. And when, they, when the money came in, it changed the character and the outlook of the Putin regime. They started saying, hey, we're powerful again, we're great again, we don't have to listen to what other people tell us. And they also saw this stream of money and thought, hey, we'll have some of that for ourselves. So they started effectively stealing it, and they started by locking up Mikhail Hodakovsky, who was running the most successful oil company in Russia, and taking that into their own hands. And it's part of Rosneft now, and Rosneft is run by one of Putin's closest allies, Igor Sechin. So there was a sort of change of mood from about late 2003, but really after the Orange Revolution, I think Putin's attitude was the West had supported the democratic side in Ukraine, the Orange parties. They had betrayed him because he had so desperately wanted uh, his own stooge, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, to win that election, that rigged election. Yeah, and on that point, um, when Viktor Yanukovych was forced out um, and Ukraine chose closer alliances with Europe, uh, Putin was forced into the arms of China, you write. Um, he said it's a partnership without limits. What is the reality? The reality is that the Chinese are placing very clear limits on this partnership. Very significantly, the Chinese are not providing weapons to be used in the war against Ukraine. They're very happy to sell the Russian spare parts to be used in their manufacturing, but they're not supplying weapons. So Russia has had to go in a very humiliating way to dodgy regimes like Iran and uh, North Korea. And Putin's gone there on bended knee to, to meet the uh, North Koreans and say, please, can I have artillery shells? Uh, the Chinese have made public statements actually supporting the concept that Ukraine is a sovereign independent state, supporting respect for the UN Charter, uh, uh, none of which is music to Putin's ears. What the Chinese are doing is they're trying to exploit Russia's weakness. They're striking a lot of trade deals very much to China's benefit. They're now producing most of the cars that are built in Russia. Uh, Russia's trade with China ha ha has doubled. Uh, so the Chinese are cherry picking the bits of this relationship that they like, but they are not writing a blank tech check. The other significant thing is the Chinese have made it absolutely clear privately to the Russians, but also publicly, that they would in no way support any thought of using nuclear weapons against Ukraine. Mm. And just to, to go back to the early 2000s, and he was forced to look for new friends abroad. Um, at home, after his first two largely popular terms as president, things began to change. Why did he start to lose popularity and how did he react? Um, I think he started to lose popularity because he stayed too long. But very much there was a sort of turning point when he did this manoeuvre to... He would had two terms as president. The Constitution didn't allow him the third term. He's changed that in the referendum in 2020. Uh, so he put in this token figure, Dmitry Medvedev, a rather weak man, to pretend to be president for four years, while Putin kept Medvedev on a leash, Putin as prime minister. And the Russian people really didn't like that, and they particularly disliked it when, in 2011, coming up to the 2012 election, Putin clicked his fingers and he said to Medvedev, well, actually, you push off out of the way. I'm coming back as president. <laughs> that triggered some quite big, the biggest demonstrations ever against Putin, in which Alexei Navalny came to prominence with his slogan that this is the party of crooks and thieves. Uh, and ever since then, uh, Putin has had to clamp down more and more harshly on the internal security of Russia, locking up more people, uh, and that shows that he doesn't believe that he's sufficiently popular to run this country without repressing the people. For how much longer do you think President Putin will be able to go on eliminating any opposition and repressing the people? I think the power of the internal security organs in Russia now is greater than it has been at any period since Stalin. I think Putin is utterly ruthless, as he has shown uh, in his treatment not only of Navalny, but of many other opposition figures 
that he will do whatever is necessary to keep the situation under control. Uh, and I'm afraid that it will be very, very difficult for Russia to escape from Putin's grasp while Putin is alive. And Putin has built up this vast army of security organs around him, all of which are controlled by people who are there because they are 200% loyal to Putin and are implicated uh, and incriminated in the corruption of his regime. So they can't afford to have a change of leader either. They would be at risk. When you uh, review that lengthy speech you gave about two weeks ago to the nation, um, last a couple of hours, what kind of leader did you see? Uh, he was looking much more confident than he was a year ago because Russia is doing less badly in the war. It's not exactly winning the war, but it's made some small advances at huge cost in terms of people. So I think that has boosted his own morale. Uh, and he was coming across in this very arrogant, confident way. The other thing he was doing in this big annual address that he gives to the nation, like the American president's State of the Union message, was he was telling Russia, really, we are now on a war footing. He didn't use those terms, but he was appealing to every section of Russian society to get involved in the war effort in whatever way they could to support it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, when this operation started two years ago, he said it's not a war, it's a special military operation. And he tried to present it as something rather limited on the borders of Russia that wasn't going to affect life across the country. That message has now definitively changed. Uh, Russia is on a war footing now and its whole budget is being geared to the war and people are being asked to make sacrifices, which after a while they are going to get fed up with doing. Mm. And as you look ahead to the next term of President uh, Putin's presidency, um, you point to two problems, um, the consequences of the war in Ukraine and his ageing regime. How will he face up to those challenges? Well, I think he'll get through this year all right. But as you get through into 2025 and beyond, the costs of the war, the economic costs mount considerably, the cost of financing it. Russia may begin to start running out of artillery shells. Uh, it's already had to go to North Korea for them. Uh, so you'll start to run into problems like that. Above all, the horrendous death toll and toll in injuries from Russia is going to bear down on the country and the population. It's estimated that there are now already 65,000 young Russian men walking around or not walking around without a limb that they've lost in the war that uh, the total casualties by the end of this year are likely to be in the region of half a million dead and seriously injured. So that is all going to put a lot of pressure on the regime. It will have less money to spend on things like health care and education and other budgets that really need a lot of help. That's one problem. The other problem is that everybody close to Putin, Putin is 71, everyone close to Putin is between 69 and 72. And they're not all going to live for the next six years. And some of them are going to get old or disabled or, you know, they're going to move on. Gradually, this regime is going to crumble. I don't think it's going to topple overnight at any point. But I do see a process happening as life gets more difficult, that it becomes harder and harder for Putin to retain control and to keep the same group of people around him. And he will be aware of that. Do you see any potential successor to him? And do you see him preparing for this and the future of the Russian Federation? Because Putin is a very insecure individual, he has always been extremely careful never to have an heir apparent. Uh, what the regime has been doing is grooming and putting in middling positions uh, another generation of people who they see as loyal to themselves. Some are regional governors, some are in government positions, ministerial positions, or in the Kremlin, and they're sort of age 45 to 55. And out of that group will emerge, I suspect, the next leadership of Russia, because I think they will succeed in keeping control of Russia by using Putin's methods. But once there is a change of leadership, I also think that they're going to start to distance themselves from Putin, from his cult of personality. I think we will see the beginning of a process of de-Putinization happening quite soon after Putin has left or has been gathered by the Grim Reaper. And how, how can you define what you mean by de-Putinization? 
well, I think it will be convenient to the next leader of Russia to blame the problems on Putin. I say these were Putin's personal decisions. They will try to retain the essence of the same system of control. But when you take the war in Ukraine, the next leader of Russia, who will not be a liberal Democrat, uh, I think we can totally exclude that possibility, alas, uh, will at least have the possibility of saying this war is costing us a horrific amount in casualties and in finance. Uh, and what benefits is it bringing us? We're under sanctions from the West. Uh, we are gaining very, very little. We're actually gaining nothing from this war. And so they could take a more pragmatic decision that Putin absolutely is incapable of taking, despite the fact that the regime would not suddenly become a much nicer regime than the current one. As you look further down the road, I think generational change will slowly, and I'm looking quite a long way down the road now, start to bring Russia back towards a path of modernization, because that's what the people of Russia want. Mm -hmm. But the big problem there will be how do they escape from the grip of China? Putin has put them absolutely into the hands of President Xi. They are so dependent on the Chinese, and they have created such a chasm between Russia and the West that, that any process of reconciliation between Russia and, and Western Europe or the West generally is going to be incredibly slow, even after the distant point when there is a settlement of the war in Ukraine. What, what, what role do you see um, for diplomacy in the future between the West and Russia? I mean, do you, how, how much longer uh, would the waiting game be before that could actually have any kind of useful impact? Well, we exercised diplomacy right through the worst days of the Cold War. It is very important to keep in contact with your adversaries, to negotiate with them. Um, I think there's a really important role for uh, everybody outside Russia, particularly Russians outside Russia, to keep pumping the truth, keep pumping information into Russia. I think that's one factor that over time, particularly with the assistance of the Internet and the smartphone, will work in the direction of evolutionary progressive change in Russia. Uh, there will come a time, I think, when a future Russian leader wants to extricate Russia from this war. At that moment, clearly diplomacy will come into play. But I don't think this is going to happen while Putin is leader. I don't think he is ever prepared to offer any kind of deal to Ukraine that the Ukrainians would dream of accepting because Putin will insist on retaining not only territory, but effective control over Ukraine to stop mm -hmm. Ukraine having freedom of action in the international arena. How great is the risk, do you think, of the war in Ukraine escalating to a war between Russia and NATO? Uh, I think right from the very beginning, NATO and President Biden have been extremely conscious of that risk right at the beginning of this war. One of the points that Biden made, and he's never departed from this, was that we, NATO, are not going to get into a direct war with the Russians. That would be incredibly dangerous. And I think that's why NATO didn't send aircraft to impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine when Zelensky was asking for that in the early days of the war. Uh, I don't think that NATO is ever going to send uh, formations of troops into Ukraine to fight against the Russians, because the moment that happened, you are on the bottom rung of an escalatory ladder that gets uh, unbelievably dangerous. We need say no more. And when you hear recent comments by President Putin, um, timed conveniently before the just before the presidential elections, that Russia is ready for nuclear war if the US sends troops to Ukraine, that it would be ridiculous to start negotiations with Ukraine just because he says that it's running out of ammunition. What do you understand his real position and intentions to be? Well, Putin has used nuclear threat as an effective deterrent throughout this conflict. To a degree, it's worked. It certainly has, I think, stopped NATO formations from going in to fight directly in Ukraine. Uh, so he's playing that game again. Uh, there's a large element of bluff in this, but you cannot totally discount possible scenarios in which the Russian military might use a low yield so-called battlefield nuclear weapon if they started losing badly in Ukraine. 
So um, that has got to be factored into account. Uh, as for negotiations, Putin at no stage since this war began or in the run up to the war has ever suggested that he is willing to negotiate on any acceptable basis at all. And even if he was, would anybody trust his signature on a deal? I don't think they would. This is a man who's lied and lied and lied. And when you look back at all that you've learned in your 34 years of dealing with the USSR and Russia, do you think there is anything that might have stopped Putin on the path he's taken Russia? And what can stop him now? Well, uh, what would have, have prevented this would be if Boris Yeltsin had chosen somebody else to be his successor <laughs> as president of Russia, because almost nobody else in the Russian elite would have taken the incredibly stupid, crazy, misjudged decision that Putin took to invade Ukraine. There would have been tensions, there were tensions which were much wider between the West and the Russian Federation over the independence of the country's neighboring Russia, which Russia regards as being part of its zone of interest. But I don't think that would have reached the point that this has reached. The Russians were cohabiting quite comfortably with Ukraine under its previous presidents. There wasn't a big, big issue. But Putin has this fixation that he has to control Ukraine by any means and has been prepared to go to the ultimate in a way that almost no other Russian leader would have done. Um, whether with hindsight uh, there is anything the West could have done to have head this off, uh, I think is very difficult because um, essentially the question is, should we have been prepared to sacrifice our support for the sovereignty of Ukraine and other countries neighboring Russia, like Georgia, like Moldova, which Russia is trying to dominate? Uh, that would be a gross breach of our principles, our values, and indeed of international law. Um, so uh, you can say with hindsight that a stronger reaction when Russia annexed Crimea and uh, infiltrated Donetsk and Lugansk in 2014 uh, might have preempted this. Maybe, maybe not. We did react. There were some sanctions at the time. That was actually the beginning of the breach between the West and Russia. It was the time when Putin, having no friends in the West, started turning to the Chinese. Um, so maybe that would have changed things. Uh, maybe not. Uh, you could argue that the European Union might have gone slower in developing its association w agreement with Ukraine because clearly that was a neuralgic point with Russia. But the Ukrainians wanted to sign a deal with the European Union. They had every right to do so. We should defend their right to do so. At some point or another, um, this argument was going to come to a head. Uh, but without Putin, I don't think it would have come to a very, very bloody war. And just the second part of that question, what can stop him now? Um, time, I think the realization that the Ukrainians are never going to give up fighting for their freedom and their sovereignty. And any assessment you see of Ukrainian public opinion shows that they are absolutely determined to continue to defend themselves, even if they have to concede territory, despite the horrific price that they are paying for defending their freedom. Uh, I think that if the Europeans sustain their support or increase their support for Ukraine, uh, so that Ukraine can succeed in holding out against Russia, uh, that eventually will mean that Putin fails. Clearly, the Americans could play an enormously helpful part if right now the American Congress was able to pass this uh, package of $60 billion worth of aid that has been stuck in the Congress for the last four months. That would give an enormous boost to Ukrainian morale and a great boost to the Ukrainian effort. But even without that, the Ukrainians are never going to give up. And ultimately, that is what will ensure that Putin fails, because I don't believe that the Europeans can afford to stop supporting him. And I think we are in a situation where we know now that we have got to increase our own defensive efforts, not only our support for Ukraine, but our own military budgets, 
We're beginning to debate that here in this country. You're now starting to get ministers saying we need to go to 2.5%, 3% of GDP. Actually, when the Cold War ended, we were spending 4.6% of our GDP on defense. In the middle of the Cold War, it was near a 6%. Despite all our economic problems, we can spend more to improve our armed forces. We desperately need to do so. And the security of this country has got to be our highest priority, despite all the other claims on the budget. So there is a lot of stuff that we can do and that uh, our fellow European members of NATO can do, uh, even if the Americans at the moment are a slightly uncertain quantity. Sir Roderick Lyon, it's been great speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. You've been watching Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. If you'd like to support us, you can subscribe now or listen to Times Radio or go to thetimes.co.uk. My thanks to our producer, Louis Sykes, and to you for watching. Bye-bye.